Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to this Book of Mormon podcast. We are now into Alma chapter 10. So now we're going to have uh, Amulek join here with uh, Alma, and he's going to do some preaching to these people. Uh, verse 1, Now these are the words which Amulek preached unto the people who were in the land of Ammonihah, saying, I am Amulek, I am the son of Gedona, who was the son of Ishmael, who was a descendant of Amminadi. And it was that same Amminadi who interpreted the writing which was upon the wall of the temple, which was written by the finger of God. Now, this must have been recorded in the large plates of Nephi, because this is the first time this is mentioned, uh, and it may have been in the, in the book of Lehi, and was therefore not explained further. Or Mormon just didn't include the explanation in his editing for some reason. We don't even know what this is about. Verse 3, And Amminadi was a descendant of Nephi, who was the son of Lehi, who came out of the land of Jerusalem, who was a descendant of Manasseh, who was the son of Joseph, who was sold into Egypt by the hands of the brethren of his brethren. So now here we have mentioned that uh, Nephi is descended through Manasseh. Erastus Snow, I think we mentioned this earlier on in the in first Nephi probably. The prophet Joseph Smith informed us that the record of Lehi was contained on the 116 pages that were the that were first translated and subsequently stolen and of which an abridgment is given us in the first book of Nephi. <coughs> which is the record of Nephi individually, he, he himself being of the lineage of Manasseh, but the, that Ishmael was of the lineage of Ephraim, and that his sons married into Lehi's family, and Lehi's sons married Ishmael's daughters, that fulfilling the word of Jacob upon Ephraim and Manasseh in the 48th chapter of Genesis, verse 16, which says, And let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and, and, uh, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Thus, these descendants of Manasseh and Ephraim grew together upon this American continent with a sprinkling from the house of Judah, uh, from Mulek descended, who left Jerusalem 11 years after Lehi and founded the colony, afterwards known as Zarahemla, found by Mosiah, thus making a combination, an intermixture of Ephraim and Manasseh with remnants of Judah. And for aught we know, the remnants of some other tribes that might have accompanied Mulek, and such have grown up upon the American continent. Uh, Daniel Ludlow said, uh, Some students of the Book of Mormon have wondered how descendants of Joseph were still living in Jerusalem in 600 BC when most members of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were taken into captivity by the Assyrians around 721 BC. A scripture in 2 Chronicles may provide a clue to this problem. This account mentions that in about 941 BC, Asa, the king of the land, gathered together at Jerusalem all of Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with whom with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh. So these strangers out of Ephraim and Manasseh who were gathered to Jerusalem in approximately 941 BC may have included the forefathers of Lehi and Ishmael. Verse four, and behold, I am also a man of no small reputation among all those who know me. And behold, I have many kindreds and friends and I also have acquired much riches by the hand of my industry. So does that sound like you guys? Are you guys popular like that? Do you have many kindred, kindreds and friends? I'm sure you do. Verse 5, Nevertheless, after all this, I never have known much of the ways of the Lord and his mysteries and marvelous power. I said I never had much known much of these things, but behold, I mistake, for I have seen much of his mysteries and his marvelous power, yea, even in the preservation of the lives of this people. Nevertheless, I did harden my heart. One assumes that Amulek had not been a bad man. He seems to have been a member of the church in that day, one who had witnessed the miraculous had heard the truth preached numerous times and seen God's hand working, but had not opened himself to the realm of divine experience. That's from Millet McConkie. Continuing verse 6, For I was called many times, and I would not hear. Therefore I knew, con I knew concerning these things, yet I would not know. Therefore I went on rebelling against God in the wickedness of my heart, even until the fourth day of this seventh month, which is in the tenth year of the reign of the judges. The voice of the Lord calls to us regularly. It is not wickedness or, car or carnality alone which keep us from feeling and hearing the word. It is preoccupation. We need not be guilty of gross sin to be unready for the impressions of the Spirit. 
we need only have our minds and hearts focused upon other things. To be so involved in the thick of thin things that we are not taking the time to ponder or meditate upon matters of substance, excessive labor in secondary causes leads to a lessening of spiritual opportunities. And that was by Millet McConkie. Verse 7, As I was journeying to see a, a very near kindred, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto me, and said, Amulek, return to thine own house, for thou shalt feed a prophet of the Lord, yea, a holy man, who is a chosen man of God, for he has fasted many days because of the sins of this people, and he is, he is an hungered, and thou shalt receive him into thy house, and feed him, and he shall bless thee and thy house, and the blessing of the Lord shall rest upon him, or rest upon thee and thy house. And it came to pass that I obeyed the voice of the Lord, and returned towards my house, and as I was going thither, I found the man whom the angel said unto me, Thou shalt receive into thy house. And behold, it was this man who has been speaking unto you concerning the things of God. And the angel said unto me, He is a holy man, wherefore I know he is a holy man, because it was said, said by an angel of God. And again I know that the things whereof he hath testified are true. We teach and then we testify. This is kind of the missionary pattern, where missionaries teach, and then the second one will testify and then teach, and then the next one will testify and teach again. For behold, I say unto you that as the Lord liveth, even so has he sent his angel to make these things manifest unto me. And this he has done while this Alma hath dwelt at my house. For behold, he hath blessed mine house, he hath blessed me and my women and my children and my father and my kinsfolk, yea, even all my kindred hath he blessed. And the blessing of the Lord hath rested upon us according to the words which he spake. And now when Amulek had spoken these words, the people began to be astonished seeing there was more than one witness who witnessed, who testified of the things whereof they were accused, and also of the things which were to come, according to the spirit of prophecy which was in them. So they understood the law of witnesses, and here they, they're astonished that now there's a second witness. Nevertheless, there were some among them who thought to question them, that by their cunning devices they might catch them in their words, that they might find witness against them, that they might deliver them to their judges, that they might be judged according to the law, and that they might be slain or cast into prison according to the crime which they could make appear or witness against them. Now it was those men who sought to destroy them, that who were lawyers, who were hired or appointed by the people to administer the, the law at their times of trials, or at the trials of the crimes of the people before the judges. Now these lawyers were learned in all the, all the arts and cunning of the people, and this was to enable them that they might be skillful in their profession. And it came to pass that they began to question Amulek, that thereby they might make him cross his words or contradict the words which he, which he should speak. Sure is a good thing that we don't have lawyers and judges like that today, isn't it? Was that sarcastic? He nibbly said, Alma 10 is the legalistic chapter. It's on legalism and lawyers. It packs a real wallop and shows immense insight. This was translated in 1829 before Joseph Smith had had any of his, his experience with lawyers. He was hauled into court and went through the routine 42 times. They were always bringing him to court. Americans were just as legalistic then as they are today. But remember that this was written before he had any of that experience at all. <clears throat> he knew nothing about lawyers or anything else. He had just lived on the farm all his life. <clears throat> this chapter is really <clears throat> excuse me, something, and we're on verse 13. I'm obviously quoting from Hugh Nibley here. They began to question Amulek using cunning devices that they might catch him in their words, that they might find witness against them, that they might deliver them to their judges. That's the whole business of lawyers to make your sight appear whatever it is. And that's the I, that's the art of rhetoric, as Plato said, and that's why we that's why he damned it. The Greeks were shocked by this new art, the art of the lawyer, which made the made the worse which made the worse appear the better reason. That's the skill of rhetoric. You can take either side and make it win. Whether it was good or bad had nothing to do with it. You, have, you won the case. That's what you are supposed to do, to make the worse appear the better. Reason shocked everybody. That's why we have, that's what we have here. So that's what he's talking about here is these lawyers are trying to trip them up. Joseph Fielding Smith said, We must be prepared to defend the truth, and as men holding this holy priesthood, which was restored by the opening of the heavens and the laying on of hands by holy messengers sent forth from the presence of the Lord, be prepared to protect the members of the church against the cunning devices that are being employed in opposition to the gospel to wean away our members who are not sufficiently informed and who lack the abiding testimony which faithfulness and, and obedience will ensure to every soul. 
war quietly, insidiously, and with some fear because of the spread of the truth is being waged against the restoration of divine truth. Verse 17, Now they knew not that Amulek could know of their designs, but it came to pass as they began to question him. He perceived their thoughts, and he said unto them, O ye wicked and perverse generation, ye lawyers and hypocrites, for ye are laying the foundations of the devil, for ye are laying t traps and snares to catch the holy ones of God. Ye are laying plans to pervert the ways of the righteous, and to bring down the wrath of God upon your heads, even to the utter destruction of this people. Yea, well did Mosiah say, <clears throat> who was our last king, when he was about to deliver up the kingdom, having no one to confer it upon, causing that this people should be governed by their own voices. Yea, well did he say, that if the time should come, that the voice of this people should choose iniquity. That is, if the time should come, that this people should fall into transgression, they would be ripe for destruction. And now I say unto you that well doth the Lord judge of your iniquities, well doth he cry unto this people by the voice of his angels, Repent ye, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> yea, well doth he cry by the voice of his angels that I, I will come down among my people with equity and justice in my hands. Yea, and I say unto you that if ye were not, if it were not for the prayers of the righteous, how who are now in the land, that ye would even now be visited with utter destruction. Yet it would not be by flood, as were the people in the days of Noah, but it would be by famine and by pestilence and the sword. But it is by the prayers of the righteous that ye are spared. J. Reuben Clark said, The Lord has made it plain to us that, it, that if we are not a prayerful people, if we fail to, to remember the king of this land, Jesus Christ, we can lose all, those, all these blessings. We should hearken to the words of Amulek when he said to his people, uh, what I just quoted in 22 and 23. And so it seems to me that what we need is in this fair land of ours is a shining example of prayerfulness and the Latter-day Saints are the people who are chosen to exemplify to the world the power of prayer. Every Latter-day Saint home should be a house of God where the altar of prayer is ever in use and where the proper example is set to our children in supplicating God for divine guidance in all of our endeavors. President Kimball said, Our world is now much the same as it was in the days of the Nephite prophet, who said, If it were not for the prayers of the righteous, we should even now be visited with utter, utter destruction. There are many upright and faithful who live all the commandments, and whose lives and prayers keep the world from destruction. Uh, President Hinckley said, I think we stand in this dispensation like the righteous in the days of the cities of the, of the plains, where, when perhaps the Lord might spare the wicked, some of them because of the righteous. That places upon us a great and significant burden. That's why we are here to make of ourselves more effective instruments, truer, truer warriors under the direction of, our, of the Almighty to save his sons and daughters from those things which will destroy them in time and for eternity unless they turn their lives around. Continuing verse 23. Now therefore, if ye will cast out the righteous from among you, then will not the Lord stay his hand, but in his fierce anger he will come out against you. Then ye shall be smitten by famine and by pestilence and by the sword, and the time is soon at hand, except ye repent. And now it came to pass that the people were more angry with Amulek, and they cried out, saying, This man doth revile against our laws, which are just, and our wise lawyers whom we have selected. But Amulek stretched forth his hand and cried with the mightier unto them, saying, O ye wicked and perverse generation, why hath Satan got such hold, such great hold upon your hearts? Why will ye yield yourselves unto him that he may have power over you, to blind your eyes that ye will not understand the words which are spoken according to their truth? For behold, have I testified against your law? Ye, ye do not understand. Ye say that I have spoken against your law, but I have not, but I have spoken in favor of your law to your condemnation. And now, behold, I say unto you that the foundation of the destruction of this people is beginning to be laid by the unrighteousness of your lawyers and your judges. And now it came to pass that when Amulek had spoken these words, the people cried out against him, saying, Now we know that this man is a child of the devil, for he hath lied unto us, for he hath spoken against our law. And now he says that he has not spoken against it. And again, he has reviled against our lawyers and our judges. And it came to pass that the lawyers put it upon the hearts that and upon their hearts that they should remember these things against him. And there was one among them whose name was Zizram, or Zezram, sorry. Now he was the foremost to accuse Amulek and Alma, he being one of the most expert among them, having much business to do among the people. Now the object of these lawyers was to get gain, and they got gain according to their employ. So now we're going to hear a little bit more in the next chapter about Zezram and some of his uh, 
methods and means of trying to, to trip up uh, Alma and Amulek. I know that these things are true and that uh, these stories are for our benefit and we can glean from them the principles associated with them and understand the doctrines of the gospel better. I bear that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next time. Bye.